Open your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians. We are concluding chapter 3. Man, we are flying through this book. And uh, as I keep saying pretty much every week, I'm loving it. So I, pr- I, I pray that uh, it's also been a blessing uh, for you guys working through what is this biblical blueprint on how God wants his church to look. And Paul gives us this awesome example in the Thessalonians. He gives an awesome example, in and, even in and of himself, from his ministry to the Thessalonians. And so we have been working through that little by little, but I think now as we seek to uh, uh, work through the second half of chapter three, we're gonna continue and see more themes as we work through on how we can apply these uh, examples to our lives, all these exhortations, all of these commandments. And we're really doing the second half of what was last week, Paul's longing to see them. He mentions to this church and he had felt in his own heart that he wished that he could just be with them and come see them, but he had experienced hindrances from Satan. We don't know exactly what that looked like. Maybe uh, severe persecution had stopped him from coming to see this church. We know that that was rampant in the city of Thessalonica. That was the entire reason that he had to leave that city so that he could avoid some of the mistreatment that he was getting. Not only did he have to leave that city, but they had also followed him to other cities in order to stir up riots against Paul Timothy and Silas. But as we go through now, what is kind of the result of Paul's longing to see them, right? He says, I'm longing to see you guys, but the best I could do was send Timothy in my place. What we have now in the second half of chapter three is Timothy's encouraging report. Well, what actually, what was actually the result of sending Timothy in his place? Here is what he's going to work through. And I don't want you to count it out Right? Like, oh, this is, just, this is just Timothy's encouraging report. This is just the second half, really, of what we were working through last week. But there is still a lot to glean from in this text. Last week, Paul described the, the anguish of not being able to see his fellow children in the faith. His mission, however, as a result of hearing back all of this good news from Timothy, his mission was a success. He's fearing, he's not sure how the church is going. He doesn't even know if there's a church there anymore to begin with. Maybe maybe the the, the persecuting Jews had killed all the Christians. Maybe all the Christians had turned to idols again after his departure, but he learns from Timothy. And as we get uh, a little bit of the answer back from Timothy in this second half of chapter three, he learns that they're doing great. As we've been working through so far, they've been doing great. Their faith is multiplying. They have a working faith. They labor in love. They have steadfastness of hope. They are doing well because of the Spirit of God making a difference in their life. So Paul hears all all about how well they are doing, and he praises God for this church and continues to do so. He hears all of this from, uh, from Timothy and what we're reading now, and he had sent Timothy back to Thessalonica. He had sent Uh, Silas back to Philippi to hear about the church's faith for a purpose, to know whether the kingdom of God was flourishing, and indeed it was. He is back from them in Corinth that they're doing well, and from Corinth he sends his letters out in order to further encourage the church. So that's sort of where we're at right now. That's sort of where we're working through as we now open the second half of uh, chapter 3. So we'll read the text, we'll pray, and then we'll get into it further. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 6 to 13, it says, But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us the good news of your faith and love and reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you, for this reason, brothers, in all our distress and our affliction, we have been comforted about you through your faith. For now we live if you are standing fast in the Lord, For what thanksgiving can we return to God for you, for all the joy that we feel for your sake, brothers, uh, before our God, as we pray most earnestly day and night that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and Lord Jesus direct our way to you, and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Let's pray that God would uh, strengthen us as we seek to uh, uh, delve deeper into this awesome book. God, we thank you for this opportunity that we are gathered with one another to now open your book, glean from it understandings that we may apply to our life. God, as you do this, 
Would your spirit work in us uh, to, to unravel all these great mysteries in your holy word? And we cannot be thankful enough that we have the opportunity to do this now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, Paul. He responds to the Thessalonians in, you know, in, in their encouraging report that Timothy had uh, described to them, and he does so from Corinth. This is when, for Paul, all of the anguish, all of the pain, all of the mystery was then lifted off him. It's somewhat eased. His anxiety of whether or not this church even exists anymore is eased. They're doing well. Timothy has an encouraging report. He says in verse 6, Now Timothy has come to us from you and brought us the good news about your faith and love. That word for good news in the original Greek is the only time in the New Testament that he uses evangelion, which is the gospel, when not referring to the gospel. That's how much he cares about this being good news. It is good news, capital letters to Paul, that he finds out about the faith of the Thessalonians. It is very weighty. It is very big for Paul. He expresses joy in the comfort from this Report. He says that through all this distress and affliction, we have been comforted about you through your faith. Earlier on, we see in Acts chapter 17, some of this playing out. It says in, uh, sorry, 18. It says in Acts chapter 18, when uh, Timothy and Silas had returned from Macedonia in order to tell him all of this good news, we see him say, that when Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that uh, the Christ was Jesus. And this is where it gets interesting. When they opposed and reviled him, this is the affliction that he's now talking about in Thessalonians, right? He's in Corinth. This is in real time telling you about the affliction that he experienced back in Corinth. Speaking of the time he's in Corinth in Thessalonians, this is how we link up the, the, and do biblical theology in this way. He says in verse 6, when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, blood be on your hands, I am innocent, from now on I go to the Gentiles. This didn't mean necessarily that Paul would just cease to preach the gospel to Jewish people, but that he intentionally made that comment after the knowledge of the goodness, the faith, and the spirit-driven power of the Thessalonians in preaching the gospel throughout Macedonia and Achaia, modern-day Greece. Right? So he's, he is, he is, he is, he is uh, being reviled, he is being persecuted, he shakes his garments in a show of rejection, and then he says that he's going to now minister and focus on the Gentiles. This is what the good news and the encouraging report from Timothy and Silas did to Paul. This was weighty, this was big. He says in verse 9, For what thanksgiving can we return to God for you, for all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God? This otherwise, otherwise reworded is saying that he cannot be thankful enough to God for their faith. He cannot be thankful enough. The above virtues listed, which are fueling this entire pastoral address, is similar to the virtues that we went deeper in a couple of weeks ago when we started saying that they were working in their faith, they had labor in love, and all of the good and nice things that Paul had said about this church earlier on in the earlier chapters. But then... What I think some of you may have noticed in verse 10, there's this sort of strikingly all of a sudden difference and it sort of raises a puzzling question for us. Amidst all of these nice things that he has to say about this church, amidst all of this praise to God and, and thanksgiving to God for this church, that the, the mission is being done, the kingdom is growing, these guys are going great, he says this in verse 10, that he prays most earnestly night and day that he may go and see them face to face, and supply what is lacking in their faith. So they're not perfect. There's something there. There's something there that we can then go and see that this church is still human. We have a reminder here that although he has all of these nice things to say about them, leading up to that one verse, they are still human. There is something that is lacking about their faith. He wants to come and see them so that he can supply that thing that's lacking. So this goes to show that in the trenches of warfare, even the most zealous warriors and elites still need supplies from the higher-ups. They still need 
guidance. This Thessalonian example that has been one to mimic, has been one to uh, seek to, to embody in our, in our day to day. This example is one that Paul praises God for. He has all these nice things to say about, however, more work needs to be done. There is something lacking in their faith. Here's the first time in this letter where it finally switches off and we see the the humanity of the Thessalonians. Amongst all the good works, there is, however, more to be done. Uh, And this is a reminder for us. As we think about our own personal sanctification, we think about how well we're doing, perhaps in certain moments in life, perhaps we're in a really good season, we seem to be on top of everything, we seem to be going great, we should be reminded continually from places like this that we should never get comfortable. You don't want to be comfortable. You don't want to ride this Christian life and see it out on the other end and think, I did great, all good, but rather... There are things that we can inwardly look inside ourselves in order to uh, 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 make us more holy. We reveal new areas of scripture that cuts out certain aspects of our life that we shouldn't have, or whatever that example might be. We are not perfect, even though we have the Spirit of God, even though we are saved, even though we are freed from the penalty of sin, the presence of sin is still in our lives, and there is always more work to be done. We should not leave room for sin and temptation because we are comfortable in the place that we have created for ourselves. Paul cuts straight through that comfortability, right? He cuts straight through that gap, and he says, there are things lacking in your faith. No doubt, Timothy would have let him know what those things are. Here, he doesn't necessarily list them. He just says that there are things lacking in their faith. And he's going to supply what is lacking. This um, supplying what is lacking in the ancient world mostly referred to restoring, right? Completing or repairing a problem. Oftentimes, this verbiage of, of, uh, of supplying what is lacking would be used for fishermen, who had nets to catch, catch fish that had holes in them. You can think of the nets going cross by cross, and as soon as there is a hole in it, you will lose what, we, what may very well be your dinner or your income. And therefore, nets needed to be repaired properly. And what Paul is saying is, I will repair that. Whatever that hole may be in your faith, I will help repair that. Whatever gaps there are, he seeks to rebind them. And these young Christians that, again, as I've mentioned in the past, are probably only Christians for no more than six months, they need this. They need what Paul can give. And this is what he is saying to them. He calls them to be a pleasing church to God, but he doesn't call them to be perfect as he knows this is impossible. But in this case, he, draw, he, he can draw them closer to Christ's example through what may be lacking, through supplying what may be lacking. So what, that, what might that be? We can now consider what might that be that is lacking in their faith and how can we, how can we, uh, how can we strengthen our own faith by deciphering what it may be that, was struggling with, uh, that they were struggling with. Let us consider. I've got three main faith strengthening points, which I could imagine would supply uh, uh, faith that may be lacking. And as we talk about them, we will spiral onto more different points that can help Christians embolden and strengthen their faith. I would argue that an increase in knowledge, an increase in holiness, and then consequently a boost in your assurance will supply what may be lacking in your faith. Let's look at point number one as we kick off, an increase in knowledge. For a lot of people, that's a bad word, right? We're not about knowledge. We're all about love, right? We're, we're, we, we don't care about knowledge. That's the, that's, the, that's the evil Calvinist word. But in order to achieve a foundation of what faith means, we need to know what faith is, even, on, even in and of itself. Amen? We can't have faith if we don't do theology to find out what faith is. Therefore, knowledge is crucial. So in order to achieve this sort of faith supplying uh, point where we are being uh, supplied with what may be lacking, let's even look at faith in and of itself so that we can use knowledge to supply what's lacking in our faith. So what is faith? Wayne Grudem, great theologian, he describes it as, and I'll, I'll explain why he describes it as this, he describes saving faith, saving faith, is trust in Jesus Christ as a living person for forgiveness of sins and eternal life with God. 
That seems very elementary, like, yeah, duh, but there's more to it, right? It's, it, it, is, it is trusting in Jesus Christ as a living person for the forgiveness of your own personal sins. And there are a lot of presuppositions that go into making a statement like that, and I'll get into them. If I can boil it down and make it like just bare minimum what it's saying, I would boil it down to this. Faith is believing God, believing what he says. He says something, it is true, and it's not a lie. Faith is, is, is trusting God's word. If God has something to say about X, Y, or Z, that thing is true. Faith is, faith is acknowledging that and trusting in that. And it rules out a lot of misconceptions. What's the first misconception? Hebrews 11, verse 1. It says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. What's the first misconception about faith? And this is a misconception that often, oftentimes comes from the other side, perhaps unbelievers, atheists, or those on the outside. The first misconception of others when looking into the Christian faith is they say this, you guys have blind faith, blind faith, or maybe wishful thinking or anything like that. Right? That's the first misconception which Hebrews 11 clears up completely. They they say that the Christian faith is a hopeful reality, that you have blind faith, that you have wishful thinking. You're saying things like, hopefully all this is true, or it's most likely true, or I guess it benefits society for me to be a Christian, so I'll be that one, and I'll just go with that until I die. Fingers crossed. According to Hebrews 11 verse 1, that is not biblical faith. It says, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, and the conviction of things not seen. This is not blind faith. This is not wishful thinking. This is taking God's word and being assured that he's not lying. He's telling the truth. This is knowing God is trustworthy. It is the assumption of God's revelatory accuracy. He is just accurate in everything that he says. It is saying Since God said this, it's true. And Hebrews goes on to say in verse 3, 11 verse 3, By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of the things that are visible. So then, counter-argument. When the atheist says there is no God, and that this universe came as a cosmic explosion out of nothing, you ultimately have no meaning because you evolved space matter and your ancestors were fish, Alternatively to that, when you then say, Hebrews 11 verse 3, God made everything and God doesn't lie, which one is wishful thinking? I'd argue the atheistic claim. Why? Because to claim such an absurd statement about the beginning of the universe requires wishful thinking. You are ignoring the preconditions of intelligibility when you're an atheist. It is impossible to be an atheist and know this. I'd argue that wishful thinking, in the sense of it being wishful thinking, is the atheistic claim because in its essence, they wish for God to not be true so that they don't have to uh, go through judgment, so that they don't have, so that they have an excuse for their sin, so that they can live a life free to do whatever they want. That sounds more like wishful thinking to me. But man, as Luca sort of alluded to in the LBC, as men that, that, are, that are twisted and evil and, and, and we're born with this will that is bent against God, why would we wish for God to be true and submit to the one we hate? The reality is he came down, sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. We can have faith in him and know that we are surely saved and that he has given us a new set of wills and desires to now live for him and be grateful for him. That is not wishful thinking. If we had it our way, we'd still be an unbeliever. If we, if we, if we would wish what we wanted to wish, we'd still be enemies of him. Right? Ephesians 2, we're dead in our trespasses. We follow the prince of power of the air, Right? But God made us alive. He saved us. He changed our wills. He made us willing to believe the truth and the accurate truth of the reality that not only does he exist, but Jesus is Lord. Amen? 
Whereas the, the, Christian, uh, the Christian worldview provides a basis for all of this intelligent thought. And since true faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen, we are persuaded by the word of God. He doesn't lie. Therefore, Christians then have faith because of what he has done. Faith, to move a little bit further into it, faith is also further categorized in, in, in the reformist sense in three different aspects. And we've chatted a little bit about this before, and some of you may know this already, but the three Latin terms to define, uh, to, to categorize the types of faith. Number one, the noticia, in other words, the knowledge, right? The, the, the understanding of the data of the gospel, right? Someone says, Jesus is Lord to you, you now know that. You have that first aspect of faith that is completely necessary to actually realize and understand that Jesus is Lord, right? It's the data being communicated to you. Then you have the ascensus. This is the, uh, the accepting of the data. You, you hear the fact that Jesus is Lord. You receive that data. You hear it in your ears. Secondarily to that, not only have you just heard it, but you accept that as factual reality. And I'd argue that you can do those first two things and still not be saved. Because the third aspect of faith is then the fiducia, which is another word for trust. You can know the content of the gospel. You can agree that it's factual. And you can still love the world more. Right? You can, you can still love your sin more. You can still love your idols more. You can still love your addictions more. You can know the God of the Bible to be real and true and accept that as a reality. And yet, because of your love of the world, you can still reject the gospel and not have those three aspects. Therefore, all three are fundamentally important. So as we start to unwrap and see what is lacking in our faith, these are the sort of uh, principles that we can glean from and understand so that we can apply them to our lives. We need all three in order to be saved. If you accept and you trust in a false gospel, you are not saved. That would be having the other two points and missing the noticia, the knowledge. You are trusting and believing in a false gospel, right? So you need all three. Some of you may realize that those first two are not enough for saving faith because of the example that I gave in loving the sin more or loving the world more. That example also goes for false converts, those of which who have pretended for a long time to be a Christian and then end up departing from the faith. It is probably the case that that third aspect was the reality. They didn't want to trust God. They knew the gospel. It was taught to them as kids. Perhaps you heard it your entire life and you've accepted it as true, but just not for you. That would be falling into that category. That person is not saved. That person needs to hear the gospel. That's where the fiducia comes in. That's where you trust God at his word and completely and definitely trust him with everything you have. It's, it's the leaning on the reality of the gospel without, without uh, any fear that God is lying to you. Saving faith is trusting in Jesus as a living person for forgiveness of sins and eternal life with God, like Grudem said. So even what we did just then by describing what faith is, in essence, biblically, and, and expounding what it is, we're increasing our knowledge and our understanding in order to supply what may be lacking. This is essential. Learning about the things of God unto a renewed mind, which is no doubt Paul's intent when speaking of supplying what may be lacking in their faith. A better understanding of faith will supply what is lacking in their faith. A better understanding of all aspects of Scripture will embolden your faith, no doubt. But by necessity, if you are endeavoring to find out more about the God in which has granted you this faith to begin with, you will grow in your faith. You will have an emboldened faith. You will be strengthened by your faith. Let's look at that second point, increased in holiness. So then, if your mind is being renewed and you're learning about the things of God, you're gaining more knowledge from God and from the scripture, your mind is being changed, I would often argue that as a result of that, your behaviors will change. You will start to live differently. Your holiness would increase. You, you will be more sanctified. You will be made more holy by necessity because the word of God has transformative power in each and every one of the, the, uh, uh, anyone who is saved by grace, anyone who has the spirit of God indwelling in them. 
By necessity, the word of God, according to Timothy, since it's profitable for training and for righteousness, it will benefit your walk and increase holiness. Which may very well be one of the faith-supplying acts done by Paul in his reappearance to Macedonia to help the Christians up there. Not only preach, you know, systematic theology about, you know, about the truths of God and the intricacies of faith, but also, more specifically, preach against sin unto holiness, right? What might be lacking in their, in their faith might also be a lack of holiness in their walk with God, right? Which, which their, their faith can then embolden and solve that problem and vice versa. What the truths of Scripture do when they are applied and taught correctly, is they change your behaviors because they inform your affections. We've also looked at that in the past, the sort of the, the, the way we are sanctified by the word of God and how the word of God can inform our affections, which in turn inform our wills and our wills change what we do. They change our behavior. They change how we act. So at the top of the chain, you have the spirit working through the word of God in order to change individuals and change their, 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 uh, their mindsets. So if you have a, a renewed mind, a renewed mind that loves the Word of God, one that studies the Word of God, seeks to have it taught correctly, seeks to focus and have their lives taught by that, it will ripple to the rest of their lives. No doubt. There is no question of that. If it is applied, and it is not just empty words to puff ourselves up or to have a big head or to win all the debates and all of the rest of it, but rather to apply it to your lives, to have a changed life as a result of it. Your newfound affections and wills will have been influenced by the word of God. Therefore, by necessity, your behaviors will change. You will be more holy. This is Paul's supplying of what is lacking. He can't just say, change your behaviors. And it's like he clicks his fingers and they all change. But rather, he teaches. He teaches what is profitable for righteousness and training and reproof. He teaches the word of God that they may change their behaviors. He doesn't just go straight to their behaviors like a legalist, tell them to not do this, tell them to do this, leave the Bible to the side, I'm going to give them a list to do. So if they follow that, then they'll be holy enough to, to, to be a church that's pleasing to God. But rather, he focuses on the word of God. I'll renew their mind and I know that by necessity of their minds being renewed, they have more knowledge about what to do, how to act, what, uh, what their mission should be, what their calling is. When all of that has been renewed, then they will change their behavior. Then he will supply them with this faith-strengthening teaching. So whether it's incorrect views on sin that is going around the Thessalonian church, whether it's uh, perhaps some of the, some of the Thessalonians, they, they buckled under the pressure of all of the idols that were around them. We learned in chapter 1, verse 9, that many of them had turned from idols to serve the living God. Perhaps there are some amongst them in their midst that are still struggling with that sin of idolatry. They've still got little knickknacks of Zeus in their house and they're still worshiping towards Mount Olympus. All of this stuff was very common in Thessalonica. Perhaps they are still struggling with this. Maybe it was the persecution they were buckling under, the persecution of the, of the fake lordship of uh, uh, Caesar that was highly pushed at the time in order to stop Christians from observing Jesus Christ as Lord exclusively. Perhaps that was the thing that was troubling them at the time. Perhaps it was the temptations of distrusting Paul as an apostle because of all the slander that was raised against him at the time. We looked at that in the past as well. Whatever it was, whatever it was, Paul sought to increase the holiness of the Thessalonians by coming to them and renewing their minds. That's why he sent the letter. That's why he sent the letter to teach them things so that they know what they must do. Unto repentance. There's another word that a lot of people don't like these days. Unto repentance. Unto a changed life. Unto a life that seeks to glorify God and live 180 from the way you used to live. Unto repentance. Faith and repentance must come together. Right? There's no room for antinomianism in the Christian faith, that anti-lawism in the Christian faith, that you hate the law because Christ has died for all of your sins anyway. I'll just have this faith and, and ignore repentance. I'll just have this faith and not live like a Christian because Jesus died for my sins anyway. There's no room for that at all, and Paul knows that. That's why Paul says later on in our exact same passage in verse 12, 
1 Thessalonians 3 verse 12, may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, as we do for you, verse 13, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all of his saints. So in a passage that's all about faith, that comes through as well. The idea of repentance, turning from dead works to serve the living God, like chapter 1, verse 9. Turning from your sin to serve the Lord and be grateful, show gratitude to our King in obedience for the salvation that He has freely given to us, completely undeserving. This is an assumed reality. What is, what is perhaps lacking in their faith is practical holiness. When just speaking about what's lacking in their faith, he then says and prays to God that God may strengthen them and give them holiness. He relates both of those. He'll go into chapter 4 and how that looks, and we'll go more into that next week. But faith is trusting in God's word, and repentance says that you'll also turn your life around in tandem with the reality of your faith in God. They come together. They are not separated or distinct. They come together. They are, uh, uh, they are inseparable. The, the faith you have in King Jesus that he has offered to you eternal life comes with it a repentance that seeks to then live your life unto him and dead to sin, like it says in Romans 6. It is the forsaking of your previous life in obedience to the one who has saved you by faith. Mark chapter 115 says, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. They go together. So the conversation of faith has intertwined with it for the Christian, the nature of repentance, which is both a one-time act and a life lived unto God. To preach Christ without repentance is not only to diminish the gospel, but also to water it down. We cannot afford to do that. It is no longer the thing, uh, it's sin, once you're saved, once you're justified, as Luca was saying in effectual calling, once your wills have been changed to love the things of God and hate the things that, are, that God hates, once that has happened, sin should become something that you're sorrow, sorrowful over. It should become something you hate. It is no longer the thing that governs your nature and life, but now the thing that I as a Christian should abhor altogether. It is not something that should be celebrated. It is not something that should be tolerated or accepted. It is not something that should be loved or anything like that. As, uh, J.C. Ryle says, true repentance begins with knowledge of sin and it goes on to work for sorrow of sin. It leads to confession of sin over, uh, before God. It shows itself before a person by a thorough breaking off from sin, and it results in producing a deep hatred for sin. That should be the reality for the Christian. That should be the reality. We should be able to amen that. This is what the Holy Spirit does in the human, the undeserving man who hates God. It reveals the knowledge of sin and by necessity that indwelling leads to a deep hatred for your previous way of life. And so by pursuing that deep hatred for sin unto godliness, which is completely necessary, the only byproduct of that life is that you will be supplied in what is lacking in your faith. You're lacking faith Read the word and apply the word. Live as Jesus lived. Live as these great examples that we see in scripture live. And your faith will be reassured. It's by producing that deep hatred in your body, you will, you, will, uh, you will hate the things that are anti-God and you will love the things unto God. And it works vice versa. Then the question may be asked, and this question comes up a lot and it is worth addressing when speaking of holiness to disregard. What if... You're a Christian, you've been saved, you know all of this, but what if you're in a rut? What if you're not doing well? What if you're struggling with a certain sin? Am I not saved might be the question, right? That might be a, a very well another aspect of the way the Thessalonians might be lacking in their faith. They might be lacking assurance of faith. Well, if 
if, uh, if uh, Paul, you have all of these exhortations on how we should be living more holy, and there are all these examples here in Scripture about how people should act, you're saying all of these Christians who are sounding the word forth from their church and all of the country is hearing about their faith and all of this beauty, what if that's not me right now? What if I'm struggling? Am I not saved? Well, by supplying what is lacking in your faith, it also confirms your assurance. If by what you're saying, being holy confirms your faith and helps out what's lacking, and you're struggling and you might be fearing your salvation, what is there then to say? I'm always in anguish over my sin. I wish I could just give it up, but it keeps on afflicting me. Then Paul would supply what is lacking you in your faith in this way. You can have assurance of your salvation because although there are things lacking in your faith assurance-wise, there is nothing lacking about the faith that God gives when sending you His Spirit. There is nothing lacking about God. You might be lacking. You might be struggling. You might not be doing as well as you wish you were. But there is nothing lacking about the power of the atonement, about the indwelling of the Spirit in the dead Christian about the, 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 the gospel which has the powerful, transformative power to trans, trans, uh, change lives. There is nothing lacking in the imputed righteousness of the God-man who came to save you and to call you, as we just sung about, precious daughters and treasured sons. There's nothing lacking about the love of God at all. The only thing that might be lacking is you, if you're struggling. However, Sproul said, we are secure, not because we hold tightly to Christ, but because he holds tightly to us. He is good. What may be lacking in your faith will not and cannot change your status as a believer loved by God, as a treasured son and a precious daughter. That does not change. We change, but God's plan does not. If you have turned to Christ, as we mentioned, in repentance and faith, if those three aspects of faith are a reality for you, you know the data, you accept it as true, you lean your entire existence on that reality that it is true, you are saved. Whether you're in a bad season or not, God loves you. If those three aspects are true for you, you know the gospel, you are saved. Whether the tempter comes to you or not. Sometimes it's even the case that the tempter does come to you and make you fearful of your salvation so that when you get healed from that affliction, you have even more faith. And that's the way God works providentially. That's how good he is. The faith, even in and of itself, is something which was gifted to you to begin with. Right? When Paul says in Ephesians 2 that you were dead in your trespasses, but God made you alive, right? Uh, salvation is by faith through grace, not, as, not of works. They were both gifts given to you by God, given to you by the Spirit. That, to begin with, should settle the, the entire debate. You do not need to fear something that was gifted to you. You don't give someone something and take it back. That's not a gift. You don't give something to someone and say, a year later, never mind, I'll have that back now, please. That's not a gift. And God's not unfaithful like that. He will give a gift and surely that person will be free and free indeed. Verse 12. May the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you so that he may establish your hearts in blamelessness in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He will do these things in those who are in Jesus Christ, with Jesus Christ, all these saints. It does not work conversely. God doesn't say, try really hard and I'll reward you. He doesn't say, fix it and maybe I'll grant you eternal life. He doesn't give any of those, those, those promises, but rather he says, he changes and presents the church blameless at his coming. God does this work in us. God's the entire reason we have been made alive to begin with. Therefore, he will bring his work to completion. God changes and presents his church blameless, and we can have confidence in that when we miss the mark, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins if we confess to him and press on. Sin no longer reigns in these mortal bodies, but rather the Spirit of God who aids us in continually putting our sins to death as per Romans 6, dead to sin, alive to God. 
further confirming our election, thus making us even more assured of our salvation because we see more of God's work in us as our lives seek to change. We're always reminding ourselves that though this life will have its ups and downs, God knows those ups and downs. And not only does he know them, he destined them for our own benefit because he had loved us. So we mustn't ever think of our performance as the thing that makes us good enough for God. We cannot please him. Our works are filthy rags to God. We cannot think that way. But we should know and be secure in the salvation that Jesus has given to us, right? He made him to be sin who knew no sin so that we could be the righteousness of God. That's, that is what we are supplied with in our salvation. That is the great exchange of the gospel, that he, bearing our sins on the cross, that he, the undeserving innocent man, took the punishment for me, that is the love that God has shown us. How dare we say then that our performance adds any kind of value to that great exchange? He took our sin once and for all. He paid our debt once and for all. And what he then supplied for us in that First Corinthians verse is the righteousness of God, which is the only standard by which anyone can enter eternal life. The question is then, what do we do? While we spoke a lot about faith, that's what we do. Faith is the instrument of our justification. This is what, this is what Reformed thought. This is what, the, the, this is what Martin Luther fought for. Justification by faith alone. That faith being the very instrument that connects us to that entire reality. That entire grounded, grounded reality that he paid our debt. Faith is what connects us to that. Faith is what then applies all of those things to us in real time that we may be freed from the penalty of sin. The grounding of our justification is the fact that our debt was paid, the atonement of Christ, what he had done, his sinless nature, his imputation to us, the fact that he he, he bore the wrath of God, the, the wrath of hell that we deserved. That is the grounding, but the faith is the instrument that connects us to that. It is what receives all of those beautiful things about the gospel as reality that we may be saved. And that in and of itself is also God's work in us. We don't work up to faith. We don't, uh, uh, faith is not a work that we seek to, to, to add to our righteousness. Like we are better than the other person because we worked up to have enough faith. Even that in and of itself is God's gift to us. And that's what we must recognize in coming to faith. So if you haven't come to faith, if that is not a reality for you yet, if you do not accept the reality that Christ is Lord and he's the only Lord and he is the only way under heaven that has been given for anyone to be saved, today is the day you need to bow the knee to King Jesus. He would have suffered on the cross 2,000 years ago for your sin personally, that you may be made free from the penalty of sin that you deserve to pay off in yourselves. He would have paid it so that you didn't have to. He would have took your hell so that you wouldn't have had to. And he would have saved you. So I'll pray for this as we close out. And then we'll come to sing to our God once again. Let's pray. God, as we uh, seek as believers and fellow believers to embolden our faith and to strengthen it. God, I just pray uh, for all the believers in the room to be strengthened and emboldened to live a life worthy of you, God. One that shows gratitude to the Savior that has given his life for our salvation. One that seeks to glorify him in absolutely everything that we do, in the workplaces, in our family times, in the evangelism that we do, whatever it may be, God. May we live as those of which who don't have lack in our faith, but rather are emboldened to live more like Christ day by day as we as we learn more of scripture, as we learn to apply it to our lives, as we learn to uh, seek more of the things of God, and as we learn to, uh, Lord, live more like you. And for those of which who are in the room who do not believe God, as those of which who are in the room who who have still rejected this reality and, uh, Lord, uh, still live under your condemnation, God, would you you, uh, open the hearts of those of which who reject you? Would you change the wills and desires of those and lift the veil that is covering their eyes that they may believe in the reality and the truth of King Jesus? We know that this is true, Lord, because you have said so, and we trust and have faith in that reality. And so for those as well, we pray, Lord, that you would give them a faith that they do not yet have, and you would save them today. In Jesus' name, amen.